Welcome back everyone. In past videos we've looked at general biogeography and paleogeography. Today we're going to look at a third type of biogeography, so let's jump right in. Island biogeography is endlessly fascinating, and the reason for this is that it demonstrably shows that organisms can adapt novel traits when isolated from other populations. What's even more interesting is that what is considered an island can change dramatically depending on the subject. New Zealand is an island off the coast of Australia, but Australia is also an island. Africa and South America were also islands at one point. Or paradoxically, a lake could be an island, so could a population. Don't worry, I'll explain each one. The central point here is that what constitutes an island for populations is less about geography and more about gene flow. So the first type of island we're going to look at is the traditional island, a fairly small area of land surrounded by water. Generally the first place one's mind goes when contemplating island biogeography is the same place Charles Darwin went, the Galapagos Islands. He noticed that animals on the Galapagos Islands were similar yet different to their relatives on the Ecuador mainland. For instance, the South American Chaco tortoise is the closest relative of the Galapagos giant tortoise. The Galapagos tortoise exists in essentially two morphs, saddleback and dome-shelled. Saddleback tortoises are so called for the curved shape of their shell, which allows them to stretch their long necks up to plants. In fact, Galapago is Spanish for saddle so the islands are named after the tortoises. The dome-shelled tortoises look much like your average tortoise. Despite the seemingly large differences between the two tortoise morphs, they are the same species. They are just adapted to different environments. The saddleback tortoises are adapted for drier climates where plants are off the ground, so they need their long neck to reach up. The dome-shelled tortoises, on the other hand, are adapted to wetter climates where the plants are more low-lying. Darwin noticed the same thing for the finches, their beaks were adapted to their food source. Now, one of the interesting consequences of life having not been specially created is that we don't find specific terrestrial animals on islands that are distant from the continental mainland. For instance, with the exceptions of rodents, thanks to humans, and bats, we don't really find mammals on distant islands. The only potential exception to this was the Falkland Island Wara which was closely related to the now extinct Dusicyon avis and the living South American maned wolf. But the existence of the canid in the Falkland Islands has been explained as a result of land bridges from the last ice age. Ruminants, carnivorans, primates, parasodactyls, etc. aren't found on islands because they can't survive the trip to the island. The same is true of amphibians. Presumably an all-powerful deity should be able to put loads of amphibians and mammals on distant islands, but curiously refused to do so. I also mentioned New Zealand earlier. This island is famous for its large, flightless, and more interestingly, wingless, birds collectively called moas. In response to the existence of large prey animals, large carnivorous birds also evolved on New Zealand, specifically the legendary Hast's eagle. Paleogenomics has revealed that this bird is most closely related to the little eagle and the booted eagle. But, New Zealand even has some strange reptiles. The Tuatara is the sole remaining member of the order Rhynchocephalia, which was much more diverse in the past. And, to paraphrase Aaron Ra from my biogeography video, how would the Tuatara get back to New Zealand if it had to get on Noah's Ark? More importantly, how would it get to the Ark in the first place? But, islands can also be large, like Australia, which, along with a few islands to its north, serves to separate monotremes and many marsupials from eutherian mammals. Today, many introduced eutherian mammals, like dogs, foxes, cats, and rabbits, compete with the native marsupials and have pushed a number of marsupial species to the brink of extinction, such as the batong, mountain pygmy possum, northern hairy-nosed wombat, and Gilbert's potteroo. Unfortunately, there are many critically endangered animals in Australia, including various mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, arthropods, mollusks, and even one species of echinoderm, the Derwent River sea star. 
Africa and South America have also worked as large islands for different clades of animals. And really, aren't all continents just large islands? Africa housed a clade called Afrotheria, which includes elephants, hyraxes, aardvarks, elephant shrews, golden moles, and tenrex. Laurasiatherians, such as horses, rhinos, hippos, wildebeests, etc., came to Africa later. Similarly, South America was the evolutionary hotspot for marsupials, notoungulates, xenarthrans, latopterns, and platyrrhines, and again, Laurasiatherians came to the continent later. South America produced many convergently evolved forms, including the elephant-like pyrotherium, the camel-like macrachenia, the horse-like ranchippus, the rabbit-like pachyrochus, the hippo-like toxodon, and the hyrax-like archaeohyrax. When South America connected with North America around 3 million years ago, an exchange occurred between animals and plants of both continents called the Great American Interchange. But time to turn the idea of an island on its head. Thus far, we've looked at the concept of an island as a landmass, but an island could also be a pond or a coral reef. If a population of fish live in a river and part of that river gets cut off to form a lake, then a subpopulation of those fish could be trapped in the lake, cutting off gene flow between the lake and river populations. That lake acts as an island for fish. For African cichlids, they are often restricted to shallow areas of water, so when the water levels fluctuate, subpopulations of cichlid can get stuck in different shallow areas, again cutting off gene flow between populations. Or a population could be an island. Take dog breeding, for example. Pure breeds, i.e. German Shepherds or Beagles, are dog breeds that can only mate with other dogs considered to be closely related genetically. Their pedigrees are often extensively documented. Pure breeds represent a populational island because there is no gene flow from their population to others. The same occurs, although not due to artificial selection, during sympatric speciation, as we saw in my video, Macroevolution. So, islands can have many interesting effects on organisms. Islands can cause animals to shrink, as we saw for Hatteg Island in paleogeography, or enlarge, as we saw for the New Zealand Hass seagull. Islands can cause organisms to develop all sorts of adaptations, as we saw for the Galapagos tortoises. Islands can cause large waves of convergent evolution, as we saw for the South American nodoungulates. They can even cause speciation events. Therefore, island biogeography is great evidence for evolution, and, no coincidence, a subject regularly avoided by anti-evolutionists. You can guess why. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.